So, um, thanks everybody for joining uh, the Initiative for Sustainable Energy Policy and the Energy Resources and Environment Program here at Johns Hopkins Science today. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, have uh, Philip Benoit from the uh, Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University, where I used to teach myself for eight years, uh, talk us about uh, state-owned enterprises and uh, climate policy. So Philip is going to talk for about 40 minutes. Any clarifying questions we can take, but let's save the discussion at the end of the uh, presentation and uh, really look forward to this. So Philip, all yours. Great. Thanks a lot. It's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Always very interested in the work that you're doing in particular on India, which overlaps, I think, with a lot of what I'm going to talk about here today. Uh, basically, what I want to talk about is the fact that there will be no climate success without engaging SOEs. Now, in terms of, as a prologue, I think it's important to sort of remember what happens when we talk about SOE, state-owned enterprises. You can love them or you can hate them, and a lot of time I will say that the discussion in the international development community has to be very critical of state-owned enterprises. They're viewed as inefficient economic actors. There's a lot of discussion. The moment you say to somebody state-owned enterprise, they will immediately want to start talking to you about reforming state-owned enterprises, and the OECD has published a number of guidelines on what are some of the best ways to actually reform them, to improve their efficiency, to reduce the possibility of political patronage and the like. But one thing I just want to point out that is critical in the context of climate change is that state-owned enterprises are here to stay. You may like them, you may hate them, but the fact of the matter is when it comes to climate, you can't ignore them, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So one thing I'd like to point out is that state-owned enterprises are actually key players in the sectors that drive energy emissions. They're major players in the power sector, they're major players in oil and gas, they're major players in industry, steel companies, cement, major players in finance, I'm going to come back to this. But it's important to remember that a lot of the funding for energy investments, particularly in developing countries, comes from state-owned banks, public sector institutions. And also when we think about it, urban transit systems. Urban transit systems around the world, including in Washington and in New York, are actually state-owned enterprises. They're owned by subnational entities, and they consume a lot of energy. And then finally, when we think about the transmission systems and the like, they are often owned by state-owned enterprises. So, for example, one of the companies in the world with the largest number of customers is State Grid of China. It has over one billion customers. It operates the transmission system uh, in China. And as a result, then, when we think about climate action, state-owned enterprises, as you will see, are big emitters, but importantly, they're also big providers of low-carbon alternatives. They're major players in funding. And given the fact that they're system operators and operators of law plants, when we think about resilience to climate issues, state-owned enterprises are also major players. So one thing that you see, just going quickly through these different sectors, is that state-owned enterprises actually have a big role to play across a variety of climate-related areas. And many of them are big and famous. So, for example, in China, I'm sure you've heard about the big five power companies, state-owned enterprises, fundamentally government-owned. A variety of them have also some private shareholding, whether it's in Shanghai or Hong Kong, but basically they are government-owned enterprises. That is also true for a lot of the steel, for the steel companies, cement companies in China. Again, the financial sector. Most of the coal power plants in China from state-owned enterprises are financed by loans from state-owned enterprises, from their banks. Indonesian power sector, dominated by a state-owned enterprise. India's NTPC, largest power utility in India, state-owned enterprise. Interestingly, and I'm sure Johannes does a lot of work when it comes to the issue of providing access in India, which is being run by their distribution companies that are also state-owned. Most profitable company in the world is a state-owned enterprise, Saudi Arabia. Equinor as well, Esco, Electrobus, Petrobus. And also, 
I said, the New York City Metropolitan Air Transportation Authority. I'm from New York. I relied a lot on the services of the New York MTA. And even sometimes you don't think about it this way, but the World Bank is also a state-owned enterprise. It's owned by many states, but it is fundamentally a state-owned enterprise. So first, let's look at the issue of how state-owned enterprises are actually major drivers of emissions. Based on an IEA study that was done looking at some 2012 data, 42% of the generation capacity in the world is owned by governments and state-owned enterprises. But what's interesting is that a higher percentage of large-scale zero carbon whether it's hydropower, utility renewables, or nuclear is owned by state-owned enterprises. So the important point here is that state-owned enterprises are major drivers of emissions, not simply because they emit a lot, but also because they are major providers of alternatives to emissions. So do you know what that would look like for coal? What it would look like for coal is this would be bigger, okay. would be my so sense, because, as you would guess, because a lot of gas is going to be in the, on this side. How would you, uh, how would you describe other, it's not state, it's not private, cooperative? Self-suppliers, su self things like that, maybe some municipalities and, and the like. Uh, in fact, uh, you can reference uh, an IEA publication on this that came out, I think, in 2016, called Energy, Climate, Change, and the Environment. <coughs> they did some other analysis on this. So just looking at, for example, how it might break down in terms of sectors, this is again an analysis that the IAA did, uh, really looking at 50 large state-owned enterprises, fundamentally in China, but also in the US, Mexico, and other locations. You see their participation across different sectors. But I think the interesting point is to see what are the aggregate emissions from these 50 state-owned enterprises, it's about 4.4 gigatons of year, a year of CO2. We then actually, this was something that was done when I was at, when I was at the IA, and when I went to Columbia, we tried to update these figures. And what we did in particular is we updated some of the analysis and some of the data regarding China's power sector. And when we added in the fact that fundamentally 90, 95% China's power sector, in particular coal, is owned by state-owned enterprises, uh, uh, both power companies, as well as self-supply from industry, as well as some other uh, forms of ownership. And we added that to some of the data that we have from other countries. We recognized that the total amount of emissions that we could identify up to that point was 6.2 gigatons. And what you have here are the largest country emitters in terms of energy in the world, including the European Union. And what we see is that state-owned enterprises as a group emit more than every country or the entire European Union, every country other than China. And what's interesting about this is that we're talking about a very limited number of companies, 50, 100, 150. And so to put it another way, if you had a room where you could have, a, let's say, 150 CEOs of companies, the decisions that those companies are making in terms of what are the fuels they're deciding to combust is actually generating more emissions than, for example, the entire United States. What's important in terms of this issue as well is to sort of recognize that the way state-owned enterprises uh, are present in different countries varies. So for example, the OECD did an interesting analysis looking at the concentration of state-owned enterprises within the largest companies in different countries. And what we see, not surprisingly, is large domination in China. But it's not just a question about China. When we look at those countries in which more than 50% of the largest companies were state-owned enterprises, we see some interesting companies that pop up. Brazil, India, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Russian Federation, UAE, and China, most of which are emerging economies. Germany, Finland, France have larger percentages than maybe some other countries, but still fundamentally less than what we see in a variety of critical emerging economies. Why is this important when we think about the CO2 effort? What we have here 
is the IEA's projection under a business as usual case, this was a six degree per second projection a while ago, as compared to what the emissions would need to look like from the energy sector under a two degree scenario. And this allocation is done by countries and regions. And what's important to note is that those other countries that I noted where SOEs are very dominant are also major players when it comes to IA modeling to reduce emissions. Basically, 70% of the emissions reductions will need to take place. China, India, emerging economy, economies, and other countries outside the non-OECD. So the important point here is to recognize that state-owned enterprises happen to be major players in the energy sector and in energy-related industries in those countries that will be critical to decarbonization efforts. So you've heard a lot about, for example, uh, the European uh, emissions trading system. And what's interesting to sort of see is that when we look at total uh, emissions, energy emissions, out of the EU, we're only looking at about 3.3 gigatons. And what I want you to sort of think about, and something that maybe is more obvious in Europe, is the amount of intellectual energy that has gone into developing, designing, redesigning the European emissions trading system over the last 15 years. And in fact, the ETS covers only a certain percentage of Europe's total energy emissions. By comparison, if we just look at China's state-controlled power companies, as I mentioned before, our estimate is that the amount of emissions that come out of those companies total 3.8 gigatons. I also want you to think about how much energy, how much intellectual energy and thought has gone into the issue about how one helps China's state-owned power companies decarbonize. And based on our analysis, based on some of the initial data we had regarding the emissions from the other Chinese state-owned enterprises, we ended up with a figure of about five gigatons. And what's interesting about this is this, as you will see, represents over half of China's energy emissions. So that even when we think about China, more than half of their energy emissions come from state-owned enterprises. Here's the total for the US. Here's the total that I presented before for the world. And again, this is just based on the emissions of companies that we had identified. It did not include urban transit systems. It did not include some of the larger airlines that are owned by, by governments. So having said that, based on our analysis, we don't think you'll end up with a figure as large as total emissions in China, but you're looking at something that probably sits between the two. So on the one hand, it's important to think about the role that state-owned enterprises play as emitters, the amount of emissions we come out of there, and then to also think about how much intellectual energy has really gone into uh, figuring out how we can let, allow those companies to meet their corporate goals, meet the interests of their governments, while also reducing emissions. A lot of time has gone into uh, emissions trading systems in the EU. I would submit a lot less time has gone into thinking about how we help state on enterprises and meet their objectives. Yes. A question here. Global SOE doesn't include the Chinese SOEs? It does. So, it does. so yes. So. Basically, how can it be? So, so Just looking at the magnitude of the bar, because most of the emissions from state-owned enterprises, based on the ones we identified, are from Chinese SOEs. So, you add this is the power sector. There's probably a better way to do this graph. This is the power sector. You add on other Chinese non-power sector steel, cement, and the like. You get to about five. You add on uh, uh, emissions from state-owned enterprises in Mexico, the United States, South Africa, the ones in India that we've identified, you get up to 6.2. So these are just increments. But I put it out there because, and in this way, because I think it's interesting, for example, when you just look at this issue of the European Union and you compare it to a relatively limited number of companies in China, or even the 4.4 gigatons, 50 companies emit more than the entire European Union. 50 companies emit more than 500 million people in Europe. And the point there isn't so much to point the figure, finger at 50 companies, but to sort of recognize we need to think about how we can help the very limited number of companies uh, deal with their emissions challenges. And I'll come back to why we haven't thought so. 
So one thing again about state-owned enterprises is this. Having worked for many years at the bank and in other development agencies, the moment somebody says state-owned enterprises, there's a big fear that comes up. It's a Frankenstein, but the fact of the matter is they're back, like the Poltergeist movie from many years ago. In fact, they never really went away. But people love to talk about how they're going away. So for example, people love to talk about how in China, they moved away, the role of state-owned enterprises actually has dropped as a contributor to the Chinese economy over the last four years. Uh, there's a book out that points out that, I think in 1970, 100% of GDP was from state-owned enterprises. Today, it's down to 20%. But we've also seen that this is something that ebbs and flows. So for example, clearly uh, the current in, uh, administration in China tends to seem to favor state-owned enterprises and the type of government and control that comes with that. And that actually has been reflected in the contribution of state-owned enterprises in China uh, to profits. And what you have here is from a, a Bloomberg report, and you see the recent change. And if you think about the politics in China, right? we had a new administration that came in, and clearly Xi Jinping talks a lot more about the role of state-owned enterprises, and we've seen the percentage of profits uh, in China that come from state-owned enterprises uh, increase over the last year or so. It's not just in China. The fact of the matter is, when you look worldwide at government investments in state in, in the energy sector, it has actually increased when we look at 2012 as compared to 2017. And this is based on IEA data. So while maybe in the United States we talk very little about public sector funding for energy investments, when we look globally, what we see is not only is, some, is it something that's important, over 40% comes from the public sector, it's something that's actually increasing. But state-owned enterprises, or and state-owned enterprises, are in many ways very different from traditional private sector companies. So if you think about an energy company, an ExxonMobil or somebody else, they have a variety of private shareholders. And in fact, a recent discussion I was having with a major uh, executive at a major national oil company kept talking about how in both cases they care about shareholder value. That's true, but one thing that's important is that private oil companies, large private, publicly listed private oil companies, oil companies care about shareholder value, they don't really have a set identified group of shareholders. State-owned enterprises care about the shareholder value of their key shareholder, who is an identified member. But what's important here is so the traditional approach, and in some ways this is a simplification for, uh, to illustrate the point, care very much about profit maximization. And similarly, pricing drivers will be very, very important. So a lot of time when we think about, oh, carbon pricing, carbon taxes, emission trading system, they're fundamentally designed to create the type of pricing signals that relate to profit maximization that will drive private sector companies or households. That is what is the overall intellectual framework in which these discussions are taking place. But now let's think about a state-owned enterprise. They've got one key shareholder, the government. And why normally are these state-owned enterprises created? They're created not so much for profit maximization, but rather to support economic development. The fundamental benefit that a power company provides to its government shareholder is not the amount of profits that it will generate, but its capacity to deliver reliable, low-cost electricity to the economy. Its uh, orientation is fundamentally one of economic service delivery, not of value maximization within the company. And in fact, if a power company that is state-owned tends to make too much money, people get annoyed. And they say, why is that company making so much money? They're obviously overcharging me when it comes to electricity tariffs. Now this is a little different when it comes to oil companies, where basically the objective of oil companies is to maximize profits and revenues, but fundamentally then to sort of send them up to the government to support budgetary resources. 
The other thing that's important is to recognize the role that many of these enterprises play in terms of supporting economic activity I described downstream, but also upstream. And so, for example, what we see often is you have a variety of power companies that are built around coal. And their role is in part to continue to support the local coal industry. Social development. A good illustration of that is the imposition on a variety of state-owned enterprises around access. And let me just say, it's very interesting when you're having discussions, let's say, in the United States and other contexts, people love to talk about the role of the private sector and the need to catalyze private investment to promote access. Most successful act electricity access expansion programs have been carried out by states, governments, SOEs. <laughs> Thank you. State-owned enterprises. Did you rehearse this before? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a softball. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, you know, as I've sometimes made this presentation and had discussions with other experts, they say to me, you know, Philip, you're exaggerating. State-owned enterprises do care about profits. So they do care about profits. They do not want to lose money. But the point to remember is the difference between a state-owned enterprise and a private sector company is their objective is not profit maximization. Now, the question often comes up, even in the context of, well, what about regulated power companies in the United States? Aren't their behaviors going to be largely similar? Yes, their behavior may in the end look largely similar, but it's important to, to recognize that the dynamics and the incentives are different. What you have with a regulated utility in the United States is if Warren Buffett invests in a regulated utility, he's investing to make money. Their job is to make money within a regulatory constraint that is imposed by an external party, namely the government. When you think about a power sector, state-owned enterprise, their job to their provincial authority or the like is to actually provide low-cost electricity. So it may look similar, but in fact, the inherent dynamics are different, and that will then have an impact on how they behave and how they respect, respond to a variety of incentives. So when we think about this structure here on the right, which, going back to my initial point, people don't think about enough when they think about climate action, there are a variety of interesting ways in which we can influence the behavior of a state-owned enterprise. The first is government shareholder power. Governments own the company. Governments appoint the members of the board of directors of the company. They have the ability to issue strategic directives and instructions to the company that they own. The other thing is their ability to appoint the heads of these companies. They provide the funding. They also provide pricing drivers. And so, for example, even when you think about China, in fact, the Chinese government does impose a regulatory framework on its power companies with certain different types of incentives in terms of pricing for gas and renewables. So that is relevant. This is not actually a thick line. There are a variety of regulatory tools that will affect both types of companies. And then the other things, and there was an interesting report done by uh, a UCLA professor many years ago that looked at the issue of how do you incentivize, in particular Chinese companies, to implement environmental regulations. And in that regard, staff incentives can also help. So it's not, it's not simply a question of operating at the top, it's also a question of maybe changing the rules and the like to incentivize the bureaucracy. And the final point I want to make is that, as I noted before, not all state-owned enterprises are owned at the national level. Many key ones are owned at provincial and local levels. And there you get into another dynamic. What are the interests of the local provincial government and the local power company in terms of, for example, supporting associated economic activity in the mining industry versus what is the interest of the government in trying to reduce emissions. These are some of the dynamics one needs to deal with when one's talking about state-owned enterprises. And what I've tried to do here is to sort of set out how different state-owned enterprises may fit uh, across a spectrum with two basic axes. One is highly protected companies versus companies that are exposed to market forces. One is a situation where you have heavy government control versus a situation where you have commercial autonomy. And so, for example, government industries are obviously subjected to tight government control 
And basically, for example, the Ministry of Education doesn't have competition in the traditional sense. I put the private companies over here. Now, if we think about national oil companies, they are basically in international markets subjected to a lot of market forces. The degree of heavy government control versus commercial autonomy varies. So for example, Equinor very much prides itself on the fact that it has a great degree of commercial autonomy. So it would be uh, up here. There are probably other uh, national oil companies that are subjected to more uh, uh, influence and direction from their governments. But one thing that I think is also relevant to note when we think about national oil companies is that their exposure to market forces often differ significantly whether they're dealing in international markets versus their domestic market. A lot of time in the domestic market, they enjoy a very variety of monopoly positions in terms of their ability uh, to sell goods. But that varies depending on the national oil companies. Urban transit systems, I would tend to put more down here. Heavier government control, fundamentally often uh, uh, national, natural or regulated monopoly benefits. And the critical electricity utilities probably tend to sit more in this area. And I'm going to come back to this point, industry, a little more subject to market forces. I'm going to come back to this because I think it's useful when we think about policy tools, how they maybe may uh, relate to the type of structural schematic I've laid out here. So the low carbon transition requires state-owned enterprises because they're big players uh, in the energy and energy intensive sectors. They're big players in many of the countries with large and very importantly increasing emissions. When you look at projections in terms of what are happening with CO2 emissions in the OECD countries and the European Union, they're on a downward trend. In most emerging economies, they're on an upward trend. So what is true today is going to be even truer in the future depending on success in decarbonization activities. But the critical point is I do not want to talk about SOE reform not about changing the nature of the government SOE relationship, but rather about understanding what are driving SOEs so that we can create more effective incentives. So what are some of the potential tools that we can have that are uh, better reflective of the realities of SOEs, recognizing again that there is great variation among SOEs? Often I think uh, in terms of power utilities principles. So as I mentioned, this issue of governments as shareholders, they have the ability as a shareholder to sort of say, you go to your general assembly, shareholders general assembly meeting, they'll sit and say, this is what we want to do. Do it, they can either do it formally or informally. The ability to appoint CEOs is very important. There was a report that was uh, done for us on some of the experience in Latin America, and one thing that happened that was critical was the ability to appoint and to change uh, the CEO so that you have a climate friendly CEO if that's what you want to do. The whole incentive framework is very important. It's important to recognize that the ability of the head of an organization is actually limited and circumscribed in many ways by the culture of the organization and the culture of the organization is very much determined by not only what people are familiar with doing but what are the incentives that they have mid-level management and staff. And a critical point critical point is aligning the SOE mandate with the low carbon transition. Now the reality is when it comes to SOEs as is true in other areas is that fundamentally state-owned enterprises are created to serve a particular governmental and corporate objective. Low cost reliable provision of electricity. If you want to come in and push an SOE to adopt renewables that are costly and with which they don't, they're not familiar, you are going to get major resistance from that state-owned enterprise at all levels of that state-owned enterprise. So issues like reducing costs of renewables is critical, as is, and I'm going to come back to this, increasing familiarity and reliability of a renewable system. And in that regard, it's very important to do capacity building. One of the studies was done was looking at the massive explosion of wind in the Mexican system uh, that occurred about 10 years ago. And one of the critical things that the Mexican government did was to improve its own capacity to understand how you integrate wind into the system, but also to improve the capacity 
of its state home enterprise to understand how you incorporate significant <coughs> amounts of intermittent wind into the system. It's important to understand that a lot of the time the resistance that you get at a corporate level is not from people who don't care about climate, it's people who may not be familiar with the technologies. And I was just in a meeting where somebody's saying, oh, we have to be innovative and the like. Well, if your job is to make sure that you do not have a blackout in your city, you are going to be a little leery if somebody comes in and says, hey, I've got this great new tech thing that you're not familiar with and you have no idea how it works, but it's going to be wonderful. You are going to resist. So one thing that we saw that happened in Mexico that is very important is as the utility got more familiar and comfortable with integrating variable wind into the grid, their willingness to uh, allow more wind to come into the system reduced, and that's I think one reason why you saw an explosion uh, of wind in the Mexican system. And what's true in Mexico uh, is also true in other countries. Financial support, targeted financial support to the extent the government either does an equity transfer or provides a loan that is limited or on preferential terms for renewables, you're likely to see a response from SOEs. Supporting research and development, innovation and the like is very important. And again, recognizing that most of these companies are not operating in a high-tech Google uh, alphabet world of California. Their fundamental role is much more basic, much more important to delivering services in a reliable manner in the developing future context. Another important point is associated infrastructure. So if you want a state-owned enterprise, or any enterprise actually, to build a massive uh, concentrated solar project out in the middle of the desert, you're going to need to provide a transmission line into the system. And you're also going to need to get your system operator to be willing to allow some of that power to come in. So in some ways, the ability to mobilize, to invest in associated infrastructure, and to get other economic and sector actors within uh, the energy or electricity system to cooperate will be important. And finally, creating new climate-specific state-owned enterprises. This is something, for example, that India did. India created a dedicated solar company. India created an energy efficiency services limited that is designed to promote investments in energy efficiency. New companies that are specific to uh, providing uh, climate action. Another area as well are all of these uh, green investment banks. Normally these green investment banks are state-owned enterprises uh, and they provide dedicated support. A lot of time the focus is on the support they're providing to um, private sector, but it's important to recognize the support they provide to SOEs. And I'm just checking myself on timing. An important point to recognize is that a motivated SOE is often your best choice. And in this regard, creating a situation where you have alignment of the SOE's corporate interests with low climate action is often the best way to tap into the resources and the motivation of enterprises which in many, in particular developing countries, have many more resources, have greater expertise, have access to more financial of funding than the government does or many of their private sector companies. So a motivated SOE is often your best bet. So coming back to the structural aspect I had described before, what we can sort of say is that arguably carbon pricing will work best in contexts that most resemble what is happening for private sector companies, where you're subject to market forces and you have a great deal of commercial autonomy. And said that, when you're looking at electricity utilities that are a little more controlled, by the government that operate within a relatively more insulated system. Uh, in fact, maybe carbon pricing an ETS system or the like isn't the best way to motivate them. We'll come back to that. Maybe things like targeted financing, capacity building may be more effective. And then when you're talking about companies that basically are under the direct control uh, of the government, the government just telling them what to do may be the best thing to do. So let's spend a little couple of minutes talking about market process because everybody loves to talk about them. So carbon taxes, one of the funny things about carbon taxes is the following. You go out and you impose a carbon tax on the state-owned enterprise. By the way, you being the government impose a carbon tax on your subsidiary being the state-owned enterprise. 
Now at a certain point, they're probably going to turn around to you and sort of say, well, what do you want me to do? I don't have any more money <laughs> to do this, so maybe you need to give me more money. What is it you want me to do? So a lot of times when people think about carbon taxes, they're really thinking about the government imposing a taxation system on a variety of multiple players out there with whom it has no relations. I'm not sure if that's the best way to deal with a state-owned enterprise in a limited number of countries. But let's spend a little time on the issue of the emissions trading system. When I was at the IA, we did a simulation uh, of an ETS with China's power companies that was organized that we did together with the Council on the, uh, the Chinese Electricity Council. And actually there was a publication on this. There were a couple of funny things that came up immediately when we were thinking about designing this simulation. Now one of the easy ones is this. So we, were, we had a number of, of power companies who were participating, in fact four of the big five. And what we did was they had a production mandate, they had a climate constraint, and they had the ability to generate allowances. Now, if you were in a situation where in order to produce, you needed to buy an allowance, you needed to, you had a strong incentive to go out there and buy an allowance. Because basically, you needed to produce consistent with your carbon constraint. The thing that was a little funnier is the following. Why would you want to sell an allowance? If you want somebody to buy one, they have to buy it from another company. What's the incentive of that other company to sell an allowance to their competitor? To make more money? That's not their job. Their job isn't to make a lot of money as a power company. <coughs> their job is to provide electricity. And in fact, they love market share sometimes more than profitability. So you could argue that in some ways, while people may say, oh, obviously people would love to trade and they'd love to <coughs> sell allowances, why do you want to sell an allowance? You're going to get a little more money, and that's not going to do you any good. So in fact, when we did this simulation, and it's reflected in the book, we had to create an incentive to sell. And basically, what we did was, we basically had that the winner of the simulation was somebody who had as much money in their coffer as possible. That created an incentive to sell. But if you think about what happens with a lot of state-owned enterprises, they are run by engineers whose job is to produce and deliver electricity. They're not run by marketing people. They're not owned by marketing people. Their job is not to generate a lot of money in their coffer, in part because if they generate a lot of money in their coffer, people are going to get annoyed at them. So one way to think about the behavior of a variety of state-owned enterprises, not so much in oil, but in other sectors, it's almost more asset maximization that gives them power maximization rather than profit maximization. And that has an impact then on what are the potential types of climate tools that will work well over it. Shadow pricing is something that can indeed help. So as compared to, it's putting a price on carbon, but it's not a market-driven price on carbon. It's rather in order to help the company figure out what makes sense in terms of investments to internalize in their investment selection process a price on carbon. Stranded assets risk is something also that's worth looking at that's different for public sector companies than for private sector companies. And here's an illustration, and we're going to be doing some research on this. This, in some ways, is a simplified uh, description of the stranded asset risk. What you have here is the NPV, the investment profile over time of investing in a coal power plant. You make an investment here, you start generating revenues here, but it takes you a while until you get to the point where you've actually recouped your investment, and then over time, you start generating a lot of profit. What's the stranded asset risk? The stranded asset risk is somebody's going to come on with a policy or some pricing thing that's going to make you shut your, your operations down at this particular point. Financial analysis, you ended up with, it goes a little longer, you've got a stranded asset, you've got a negative return on your investment. Now let's look at it in terms of a state-owned enterprise, and in particular, a government shareholder. Why does the government want the power company to generate electricity, not to generate a tariff, but rather to generate a value in the economy. And traditionally, always, the economic return of a kilowatt hour is greater than what a rational person is willing to pay for it. Why? Because the person is willing to pay for it because they feel they're going to get a bigger benefit. So you end up with a line that's actually higher in terms of the rate of return. And so if you look at this point where the climate policy has cut in from a financial rate of return, here is where you have the potential for a stranded asset, but under this simplified economic analysis, you have no problem. You're not going to end up with a stranded asset. 
you will have recouped a positive return. Okay? At the same time, let's look at it a different way. If we start internalizing negative externalities relating to your coal production, all the pollution, all the health issues and the like, you arguably maybe end up with a return trajectory that is lower than a simplified financial analysis. Again, people die and the like from the coal emissions. It takes you a while for your <coughs> benefits to exceed what's happening on the financial side. In this particular case, if you shut down the activity here, you're neutral from a financial analysis, but your government actually has overinvested or basically has wasted money. The point here is that the analysis from a government SOE perspective is going to be different than the analysis from a private sector perspective. And much of the stranded asset discussion now has been driven very much by looking at it from a private sector's perspective. We are going to do some analysis looking at it from the government's perspective. Now to come back to, I think, what is the fundamental point that I described at the beginning. Why is it that we actually don't have a lot of discussion about state-owned enterprises, given the fact, as I described, they're major players on emissions, on alternatives, and they actually operate differently? This is a variation on NIMBY, not in my backyard. <coughs> this is more, they're not from my neighborhood. The reality is a lot of the thinking around climate change, a lot of the discourse, on the one hand, we have this issue that state-owned enterprises are controversial, as I indicated. But a lot of the discourse comes out of the UK, New York, and the like, where we don't have a lot of state-owned enterprises. They're in the wrong zip code. But if we take that New York article and we flip it and look at the world differently from a different perspective, we probably would be having a lot more discussion about state-owned enterprises. If you're sitting in Beijing, it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about reducing energy sector emissions or emissions overall without spending a lot of time talking about what you're going to do with your state-owned enterprises. So I think the reality is what uh, one of the reasons I believe we've had less assessment of this issue is fundamentally an issue of geography, of placement. Uh, and as we move forward, as more and more discussion starts taking place, looking at the issue of climate change and the challenges from China's perspective, from India's perspective, and the like, I think we can sort of see uh, we can expect greater interest in the issue of state-owned enterprises. I think very much reflected by the fact that we're looking at it and you are looking at it as well. So, some conclusions. When we think about uh, helping state-owned enterprises to engage in climate, it's really an all of the above strategy. Government guidance helps. Government financial support, capacity building, research and development helps. Using market instruments can be helpful as well, in particular, for those national oil companies that operate very much in the spectrum of a commercial autonomy and are subject to market forces, and trying to generate motivation with SOEs is important. So, just looking ahead, um, I recently I published a report uh, on this issue. It's on our website. If you can look at it, that would be great. Click on it. Uh, but I think more important, uh, just last week we had a workshop uh, at Col Columbia where we pulled together uh, a variety of players from industry, from major think tanks, and the like, because our objective is fundamentally threefold. Increase attention around this issue, increase the amount of research into this issue, and motivate action, implementation action. In that regard, players like the World Bank and WRI are, are critical, as well as SOEs and governments themselves. So where do we go from here? We plan on holding some more convenings, one in India, potentially something uh, at COP, uh, in China, and we'll probably hold a, another event uh, in a year or so at Columbia. As I mentioned, we're going to do an inventory to get a better sense as to what the emissions are from state-owned enterprises, how they play out in terms of gases and geographic distribution. We're going to do some analysis on the stranded assets as I, uh, along the lines of what I described to you. We would like to undertake a corporate restructuring exercise, and we've been in touch with some business schools about this. When you think about it, BP system spends a lot of money thinking about how do I restructure myself? in order to deal with a low carbon transition, and they spend millions of dollars hiring McKinsey and other people. Well, the same type of thing is needed for state-owned enterprises in India, in China, and elsewhere. And we also want to establish a community of practice, um, pulling together academics and other people who are interested in this area. Johannes is one of the first people to volunteer to join that, so we're very excited about that. I'm also volunteering Johannes. <laughs> 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 
basically need more research, more attention, and more help on this issue. Thank you, and one last thought. Give your local SOE a hug. <laughs> I will need them to fight climate change. Thank you. So um, I think we have about a half an hour of questions so we can have a, a good discussion. Um, I'm going to abuse my uh, right as the chair to ask a first question. So walk me through what happens when, let's say we take this emission trading model. So we have a quota, we have a cap, companies are trading, they're mostly SOEs, competition is at best impartial. Is the outcome then just that the allocation of permits is inefficient? Because the environmental outcome is just whatever that quota is, right? Is that your concern with this being an ineffective policy? Okay, so I'd say two things. I'm glad you raised that because uh, that points to an important subtlety that I had not made. From my perspective, I believe that emissions trading systems are more effective in dealing with state-owned enterprises than carbon taxes. In part, but fundamentally because in an emissions trading system you have a cap, which you can reduce. So at the end of the day, in many ways, what is most useful in an emissions trading system is it, a, it is becomes a systemic way of allocating caps to a variety of different state-owned enterprises, more than a tool to get them to actually trade amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. Because again, I mean, it, it depends what type of companies you're dealing with, but to the extent that you're looking at companies that do not have a strong commercial culture, do not have a strong uh, trading optimization culture, you can expect that you're not gonna see a lot of trading mm -hmm. when you impose an ETS. You should see compliance with the cap. Uh, and in fact, there was an interesting study that was done on this by uh, Professor Benoit Mayer from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, who basically concluded in dealing with other, some other, looking at some other people as well, that when you're looking at the Chinese ETS structure, and it's interesting to note the problems that they had in actually going national with it. Mm -hmm. um, arguably, the CAP system is uh, much better adapted to their traditional approach of complying with the regulatory uh, restrictions rather than uh, the notion of encouraging to trade. And again, the point of the trading isn't so much the buying, because you'll buy it if you need it to operate, but more is there a strong incentive to actually sell. But did that answer Yes, it, it definitely did. Uh, just a quick follow-up on that. Are there examples where these kind of state-owned enterprises have been subjected to either a carbon price or ETS in a kind of serious manner? What would you... Uh, yes, yeah, so, I can't thank you for asking that question. We didn't... Um, a very good illustration of this <laughs> <laughs> is actually Equinor. Uh -huh. You know, Equinor uh, is well known as when it was called Statoil for their CCS leadership, something that they did, I can't remember, 15, 20 years ago, decades ago. And when you actually talk to Equinor, Equinor will explain that one of their drivers for them to do this CCS storage uh, policy was a tax that the Norwegian authorities had imposed on CO2. So that's one reason when, you know, when I was putting the bubbles at the end, market mechanisms can clearly help. They're probably going to be more effective in certain contexts. So it's not a question of ignoring them. But there are clearly some cases uh, where they have helped. Uh, I believe that probably even under the European ETS, at various points, you'll have some state-owned enterprises that are participating uh, uh, in, under that regime as well. I think my big point uh, on this is more, the fact of the matter is we have limited resources. We have limited intellectual resources. We have limited policy resources and political resources. We need to spend, I think, a little less time thinking about how we can optimize a carbon tax and an emissions trading system at the detriment of spending time on how we can help state-owned enterprises. And let me just say, I think the fundamental challenge that we have going forward, we have two challenges going forward. One is we need to get developed countries to emit less, to create more room under the carbon budget. But the other issue is that we need to figure out a way to help developing countries meet the dual goals of poverty, eradication, economic growth, and reduced emissions. And in that regard, we have to look at all the actors at play in state-owned enterprises or major actors. Yeah, terrific. What is? Questions? Yes. Um, so in this analysis of the Chinese coal sector, we've seen sort of a trend that, that's reflective of a broader trend in how sort of the Chinese government engages in the economy, which is that there's been less direct SOE 
investment and more financial investment by the state on various levels in private companies. And I think that really accelerated after the financial crisis when the stock market was strange and the state tried to stabilize, but now we're sort of set with this hybrid system. And it's easy for me to imagine the, the incentives for, for sort of pure SOEs, but for these hybrid players, I wonder if you could give me some clues as to sort of how to think about that. I think we, in this data set, found that it's more than half of the coal power fleet that is in these kind of hybrid arrangements. So, right. you know, is it just like majority share or sort of, you know, how do you sort of differentiate between the, the private and, and the public in, in those? Right, and that's something I, I touch upon a little in this paper. You have a you, you have a complex issue around uh, minority shareholder rights, fundamentally. So you have you have two types of structures: one in which the company is 100% owned by the government, another context in which the company has minority private shareholder rights. And in fact, actually, one of the good illustrations of the potential impact on that was the IPO that was done by Saudi Aramco, uh, which injects a certain <coughs> amount of private sector ownership subjects them to a variety of rules and from what I understand was actually one of the objectives yeah. of the Saudi government in doing the IPO was to bring in some of that external uh, uh, discipline and, and, and other issues. Um, so it's clearly that you need to analyze the situation differently depending on the nature of private sector ownership. EDF as well in France has small but significant private sector ownership. You have in China a variety of the companies that are listed uh, either on the, the Shanghai Exchange or on the Hong Kong Exchange. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's also important to, to bring a realpolitik analysis to this and to what extent are private shareholder uh, rights going to be, uh, going to take precedent over the interest of dominant government shareholders, right? Uh, so the, the, the irony is in some ways, private shareholder rights could stunt government activities to decarbonize to the extent they're not viewed as maximizing shareholder value. Um, but at the same time, you know, my, my sense would be, and I think more research is done on it, needs to be done on this, I'm sure you'll do more research, to what extent will minority shareholder rights through the Hong Kong exchange trump an overarching governmental interest in China to reduce emissions to protect the country from uh, devastating sea level rise that will affect the coast. Right? So I, I think one has to sort of look at the legal rights, and I'm a lawyer by training, but also one needs to look at the economic <coughs> interests and the political dynamics as well. Um, so it seems like from what you've said that um, like the best way to influence SOEs to engage in lower carbon emissions is through government incentives, um, just various government incentives. But I'm wondering how how can one incentivize the government to um, implement these kind of policies, like such as China and the US, who, whose governments don't really seem to have um, emission reduction as one of the priorities in national policy. So, l let me just uh, dial back what I said a little, which is to, to sort of say more of the point is that uh, uh, key players in this area are state-owned enterprises. State-owned enterprises are owned by governments. That means there is an avenue for influencing these state-owned enterprises that's not available when you're thinking about the private sector and the government activating its interests. So, it's more that we need to sort of look at a broader array of tools that state on, are available with state owned enterprises that aren't available if we're thinking about trying to influence ExxonMobil uh, and the like. Um, the, the second thing is this. Um, one of the critical points I, I, I would like to make is the following. States are the ones that signed on to the Paris Agreement. I think it's not the United States that's going to withdraw. But it's states that, have, that signed on to the, government, to the Paris Agreement with certain goals. States happen to control a lot of assets, state-owned enterprises, buildings, and the like. And as states consider ways to reduce emissions, they should look very much at what are theoretically low-hanging fruit given the control issue, but are fundamentally and often in practice not really low-hanging fruits because state-owned enterprises often can exercise a variety of powers that exceed what a minister 
they normally respond to the ultimate government authority, but they often have a disproportionate amount of influence vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ministries and other things like that. The critical issue is how do you incentivize governments, and then how can you have that trickle down to state-owned enterprises? And so for me, the, the answer to that is twofold. The first one, and as I, I alluded to this a little in my presentation, I think the critical issue that we have is how can you figure out a way to effectively merge poverty eradication and economic growth objectives in developing countries with a low carbon transition? So what we have found is when you have alignment of those two, then it's much easier to see government action and state-owned enterprise action, because then you'll get also alignment, as the second point, of state-owned enterprise corporate objectives with low carbon objectives. So the easiest case, if you can bring down the cost of renewables, as has occurred in the power generation side, all of a sudden it serves a corporate SOE objective and a government sectoral objective to invest in renewables rather than investing in coal. In particular, if you do an appropriate full-blown economic analysis that internalizes and integrates negative externalities regarding health and the like. So the critical way to actually promote the solution is to get alignment through innovation and other issues. Having said that, uh, what continues to remain the challenge when we look at climate as a general proposition is that people don't fundamentally believe that it's in our interest to prioritize the fight against climate. And that's why you get government ambivalence and you get ambivalence through a variety of, a variety of different uh, sectors. Having said that, there are certain things that you can do to try to push in particular state-owned enterprises to that type of solution. And that's what you saw, for example, Mexico, again, is an interesting case. Uh, President Calderon was very much committed to climate issues. Uh, and that very much trickled down through the government and then the appointment uh, of uh, CEOs of the state-owned enterprises. This was true for Raleigh and Uruguay. Uh, so long as you can get that alignment, you can get them to be forward-leaning. Um, Frank, it seems like the current Mexican administration is less interested in climate issues and more interested in a variety of economic issues that have to do with promoting uh, Pemex productions and the like. So you're probably going to get a backward. But the last thing I want to say that's always important is what happens in rich developed countries sets the tone. And when you have the government of the richest country in the world say, I don't really care about that much about climate, I care more about protecting the economic interests of a country that is fundamentally much richer, much, much richer than every developing country. To your point, I think developed countries say, well, if they're not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. Yes. Thank you so much. This was great. Um, I really appreciated your presentation. I assume your call for pragmatism here would resonate with a lot of folks in the environmental community. I'm curious, as you talk to audiences that are more associated with free market economics or foreign policy writ large, this obviously runs against a lot of the general thinking in the last 20, 30 years, which is standard enterprises are inefficient, sclerotic, they're bad, they just play private forces. Our pressure should always be to lessen their importance in the economy and create market forces. Do you, how do you deal with that tension when you talk to folks who aren't clued into the, you know, two degrees, 1.5 degrees Celsius moral imperative? Right, so I actually, uh, I was just on a panel at, uh, on this a couple months ago and I had somebody who was very much a lot, you know, efficiency is great. <laughs> efficiency is great. Climate effectiveness is more important. Yeah. So that's it. So, great, right? it's great to be efficient, but if the choice is to try to be efficient, but in practice it's not having an impact, at some point you have to think about how much do you care about climate effectiveness. And I think if you care about climate effectiveness, then there's a certain point you start choosing less efficient, less economically efficient, uh, but more effective tools. When you uh, spoke before about uh, community of practice, and it made me wonder, are there institutions or entities now that bring together state-owned enterprise, enterprises to discuss and trade ideas and act as a, the way there are, for example, when municipalities and other entities that are climate-focused so uh, our sense at this point, uh, my sense is, uh, as a general proposition, no, right? Or don't do it intentionally, right? Or don't do it with a climate orientation. So you have C40, right? Yeah. The group of cities, those are all government entities that own a lot of state-owned enterprises, right? 
Um, um, and that it's not clear to what extent they're looking at it through this particular prism. Uh, um, you also have, uh, at, our, at, our, at our, our workshop, we had somebody uh, from the New York State Metropolitan Transit Authority, the MTA in New York, which, by the way, uh, it was funny, when I was doing this paper, one of the comments I got was somebody said, well, that's not a state-owned enterprise. I said, state-owned, you mean it's not an enterprise? It was like, it's a public service. Well, you know, the New York MTA serves 8 million people and generates in fair box revenues $6 billion by selling a service. I call that an enterprise, and I call that a big enterprise. Uh, they do look at the issue of sustainability, and there is something called the, uh, it's a French term, Union Internationale du Transport Public, something like that, that brings together a variety of the uh, transit systems from around the world that are state-owned enterprises. So there are these groupings out there. They are looking at the issue of sustainability, but it's not clear to me that they're looking at it as much through this prism of we are different, we are important, how can we work together and how can other people help us uh, in, in meeting, uh, in, in serving this important objective. Uh, we had somebody from one of the multilateral development banks who, uh, who was just describing the fact that they're starting an initiative to look at state-owned enterprises again, and I think in some ways pushing on the reform aspect. And what he said was, he said, following the discussion that we had, what he's going to inject into that is that they're going to look at it not only in terms of improving economic efficiency and delivery options, but also how can they be more effective at advancing the climate objective. So that's one reason why you know, I published this paper, and I was very happy when Johannes extended this invitation to come talk to you, uh, because as I said, one of our objectives is to generate more interest around this. We were going to organize an event in Chile at COP on this issue. Uh, that got canceled when it got moved to Madrid, that we hope very much to organize a couple of events, both in the blue badged zone, but also uh, in the public zone on this issue. Because I think it's a question of getting more and more people to talk about it. So coming back to the question that was raised by, uh, on the environmental community. It's just fascinating to me how much when you start having a discussion about climate, everybody wants to talk about liberalized market mechanisms and loves to talk hours and hours about that. We need to get people to start talking more about, okay, state-owned enterprises, they're key, they're key on development. Right? This, this, how can we get them to do a better job of supporting short-term development goals and longer-term climate goals? Maybe you need to uh, approach Michael Bloomberg, depending on what happens today. He's seated so many of these types of Organizations. Sure, well, if you have a contact to Michael Bloomberg, I'd be happy to do that. You know, again, the tendency is when you start approaching people in this, you know, they're like, well, let me tell you, my, actually, this is something I've been working on for seven years, okay? The first time I published on this was when I was the IA seven years. Let me tell you the way the conversation tends to go. I said, have you ever thought about state owned enterprises? No, you gotta reform it. I said, yeah, I know, you gotta reform it, you know? <laughs> really big on climate, they're big emitters. Did you realize they emit blah, 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 blah? And they're also big on, people go, oh wow, that's really interesting. I say, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? And we say, yeah. And then 10 minutes later, we're talking about carbon pricing. <laughs> so there's not a stickiness around this issue. So sure, if Michael Bloomberg's people would be interested, that would be great. My concern would be, I'm from New York, Michael Bloomberg lives in New York. State owned enterprises are not very important in New York other than the MTA. They're not economic players. In the United States, they're not big economic players. A lot of the intellectual leadership on this comes out of the UK. The UK has prided itself on liberalized systems. Now maybe if Jeremy Corbyn had won, there'd be more discussion about state-owned enterprises. But in some ways, there's an ideological struggle that takes place in a lot of these com companies, countries that are very much fundamentally pro-market, anti-government intervention. And that, to be frank, pollutes this question because from a climate perspective, love them or hate them, so, um, in, in the context of um, low-income countries now, and thinking about aligning economic economic incentives for SOEs to actually provide some services at a very good cost, have you thought about using quality of service? the slider to get the right balance because most several of these countries as much as they want high quality of services the question is how much 
just how much can you pay or can you afford for the quality of service. So I'm trying to think about it from the point of they want very good high quality services. At the same time, how much does the economics of the prevalent economics allow you to pay for? Because if you get it too high, then you have a problem. And if it's too low, you also get more complaint. I can afford to pay for more than this. So how do you try to balance this now? Okay, so let me answer that in two different ways. First of all, thank you for raising that point, because it's important to recognize and acknowledge the role that state-owned enterprises play in, a, for want of a better term, least developed countries. Right? So a lot of time, the discussion will be around, for me as well, China, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, big countries that are potentially big emitters. The fact of the matter is, state-owned enterprises are actually often bigger players in least developed countries, for example, are around Sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, uh, at this workshop, we had somebody who pointed out to everybody, don't forget, for example, a country like Nigeria uh, and, and other countries. And actually, I spent many years uh, working in Sub-Saharan Africa specifically. Utilities, uh, which are state-owned, are major players uh, in those areas. The issue you're raising, to be frank, uh, is more a fundamental sectoral issue. Uh, how do you actually improve sector performance? Uh, in that regard, state-owned enterprises are important, so you need to figure out a way to do that. I would sort of submit from a climate perspective, and this is a personal view, um, I think it's important very much to be able to prioritize poverty eradication and sexual efficiency objectives in the poorest countries that are not major emitters, although they're going to suffer the most from climate change, and make sure that we focus a lot of our decarbonization efforts on the richest countries where they have alternatives and some of the larger emerging economies uh, that are going to be driving the emissions going forward. But the issue you're raising, we can talk about maybe offline because I think that's more fundamentally a sectoral issue about uh, how do you improve uh, uh, efficiency of electricity systems uh, and the like. I think it's actually that, I think what you really want to do is you want to find that sweet spot where you get good quality service in a low carbon. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean Have you been able to get a variety of SOEs from around the world in a room together to talk about this? I'm thinking like, you know, uh, power generation companies in, in China with uh, oil companies from the Middle East, with banks from Latin America, with mining companies from Africa, say that, that kind of thing. Has that happened yet? So we, we've started to do that, uh, and we actually were able last week to get a certain number of those type of companies uh, at this at this workshop, actually, I was very much surprised, it, even including also from North America. Like as somebody once somebody said to me, actually, the largest provider of renewable electricity in North America is TVA, uh, no. Hydro Quebec. Quebec. Oh, Hydro Quebec. Quebec. Oh, Hydro Quebec. Yeah. Yeah. Right, state on enterprise. Um, uh, and actually, at this workshop, we were going to have a number of people coming from China, but uh, yeah, they, okay. had, they had to cancel. So we view this work as very much of a, as an initial effort. In that regard, we're planning on having another event uh, in India in the fall that will focus uh, more on those. Uh, but but just on Indian companies, or are you going to try to get? Well, we'll be broader. Okay. We want to be broader, uh, but I think it's important that one has to be selective, strategic, and targeted. So on the one hand, it's important to have this type of overall initiative that recognizes that there are similarities. You know, national oil companies were created by their countries to serve the interest of the shareholder, the government representative of the entire people. Private sector companies, oil companies, that's not their limit. Um, but at the same time, there's a big difference between international, uh, national oil companies, for want of a better word, right. Right. Uh, and what's happening in, uh, in China's power sector. Um, I, I was having an interesting conversation, just to go about this issue about the corporate restructuring issue. Uh, because somebody mentioned that, that one of the major uh, coal producing regions in China had, had approached one of the NDBs and sort of said, look, we're interested in figuring out how we can, tr can transition out of coal. Because we sort of see when we look to the future, there isn't going to be a lot of interest in being a coal economy. We'd like to be a high tech economy. Uh, and I always found that very fascinating because I think what's true for that type of provincial authority is also true for state-owned enterprises. Uh, you can be Peabody or you can be Google, you know. Going forward, uh, 
uh, maybe one that's going to get to Google, but the reality is when you think to the medium and longer term, it is in the interest of a variety of these uh, state-owned, in particular coal companies and the like, to be able to transition. But they don't have the resources available that are available to BP or Ecuador to think about how they can do it. And so we very much would hope uh, to be able to catalyze some type of illustrative corporate restructuring that needs at the end of the day to be very project company context specific. So there are commonalities, but the fact of the matter is if you want to be most helpful other than sort of generating interest around this topic, which we're trying to do, is you actually have to get down to the nitty gritty of, of the individual companies. Great, uh, do we have any more questions? Okay, wonderful. Uh, let's thank uh, Philip one more time for your talk.